Well, I'm going to do something a little bit dangerous this morning. That's pretty out of character for me. I, I usually err on the side of caution with most things. I'm, I'm not the kind of guy who likes to take unnecessary risks. I don't like roller coasters or any of that kind of high thrill stuff that happens at the amusement park. I have absolutely no desire to, to jump out of a perfectly good airplane. And the thought of launching myself off a bridge or something else with nothing but a giant rubber band tied to my leg, that thought has never crossed my mind. I don't like to take unnecessary risks, but I'm going to do something a little bit dangerous this morning, and that is I'm going to preach on the end times, particularly the timing of some of those events. Not when it's going to happen, so we can circle a date on the calendar, but the chronology of some of those events. Now, it's dangerous for this reason, and the Bible doesn't give us a lot of the details about the chronology, about the specific order in which these things are going to happen. But that hasn't stopped us. Some people have formed, and I have formed, some very strong opinions about how I think those things are going to happen, though the Bible doesn't give us those details. And so this is where this becomes dangerous, because I know that in these next several minutes, no matter what I say this morning, there is a pretty, pretty good chance I'm going to step on somebody's toes as we look into this matter. So then why would I do it? Why would I take this risk completely against my nature? Why would I do this? Adam and I were talking before the first service, and I, and I was talking about the fact that you preach the end times, and sometimes it's a little bit precarious to start talking about some of the timing of these things. And he said, yeah, but you asked for it. Well, that's one of the reasons why I'm going to do it. At the outset of this Hot Topic sermon series, I told you this, I made this promise to you. If you ask me your questions, and I'll try to do my best to answer them. This question about the timing of the end, topic, the end times events, one of the questions that was asked to me, one of the questions that was submitted. But the other thing is this, that we have to be committed to the whole counsel of God. Not just the pieces that we have all the answers to. Not just those pieces of scripture that we're comfortable with or that are easy to deal with. We can't avoid topics in scripture just because they're hard or just because they're difficult for us to deal with. Now, the specific question that we're looking at this morning is this. When will the rapture of the church happen? Again, not looking for a calendar date, but we're looking about chronology. In that period of time, called what we refer to as the end times, where in the chronology of those events will the rapture of the church happen? And to start answering that question, I'm going to ask you to take out your Bibles, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, this is not the only place in Scripture that there is a reference to the rapture. There are other places that it is referenced. But 1 Thessalonians 4, these comments that Paul makes in 1 Thessalonians 4, is perhaps the clearest discussion, the clearest picture we're going to get of this event that we call the rapture. Now, this is how I want to approach this this morning. I want us to look, first of all, at what will happen. Kind of look at the end times events and say, what are the, the big blocks, the big Lego pieces, if you will, that we would put in place? What are the big block events that will happen there at the end times? We'll look at what will happen. And then I want us to try to assemble those blocks in some sort of chronology. How does it look like those things will happen chronologically? And of course, I always want to ask this question, why does it matter? God didn't fill in all of the details. He didn't tell us very specifically. We still have, we approach these end times events. And sometimes we have some big questions about them, but yet, why does it matter? It's part of God's revealed word. It matters, it's important to us. I want us to spend a minute or two asking that question. Why do we know about any of these things? So you've got your Bibles open to 1 Thessalonians 4. You follow along as I read verses 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Christ. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So the first question as we look to these end times events is, what will happen? What are the the big block pieces? How many of you are puzzle builders? Do you like to build puzzles? And you kind of sneak your hand up. It's okay. It's not a bad thing. I'm not a puzzle builder. My mother was a huge puzzle fanatic. She was a bit of a Michelangelo when it came to puzzles. I remember one of the puzzles that she did. It was a, it was a giant green circle. No corner pieces to get you started. A thousand pieces and every one of them exactly the same color. She was, a, she was fanatical about puzzles, but she started every one of them exactly the same way. Maybe this is how you start them. She would take the lid off the box and she would dump all the pieces on the table. She would turn them all over and get all the color sides up and then she would kind of sort through, what are the pieces that I have here? Before she even started to try to assemble anything or make sense of what she had on the table, she first looked at and assessed, what are the pieces? That's what I want to do with these end times events. Before we try to assemble them in in what appears to be a reasonable order, what appears to be a, a decent order, I want us to take a look at what are the several key events that make up this period of time that we often refer to as the end times. This time when God will usher in the final piece of his plan of salvation. The first thing to mention, this passage that we looked at this morning, the first thing to mention is what we call the rapture. That's what Paul is talking about here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, if you are an astute listener you notice that the word rapture never appeared in that passage. Not in English, anyway. We get that title, we get the the name of this event from the Latin translation of that phrase in verse 17. Read there where he says, "We we will be caught up together with the Lord. The Latin for that, the Latin word for that is the word rapturo. That's where we get the title for this, the rapture. That word in the Latin and the original Greek word in that passage, they mean exactly the same thing. For something to be snatched away or caught up by force. It's the same word, by the way, that, Je- that Jesus uses over in John chapter 10. He's talking there about a wolf coming and snatching a sheep out of the flock. It's the same word. And then later in that chapter, he's talking about the, our security in Christ. And how as believers, we are firmly in God's hand and no one will be able to snatch us out. It's the same word. It means to be snatched away or taken away by force. This rapture, what Paul talks about here in 1 Thessalonians 4, is that time then when Christ will come and he'll snatch up his church. He'll carry us away up to be with him where he is. That's the rapture in the end times. The second thing to mention is what is known as the time of the tribulation. Daniel's prophecy, we we read that this will be a seven-year period. And he says in chapter 9, verse 24 of Daniel, he he gives us sort of the purpose statement, the, the mission statement of this time of the tribulation. He says this, it is to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for wickedness. We get the the name for this period of time, for how Jesus talks about it in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 24. He said this will be a time of tribulation. That's where we get the title, how how we have named this event. Halfway through this period of time, this seven year period that Daniel tells us about, halfway through that period, There will be a single, powerful, dominant world leader that will rise to power. You may have heard him referred to as the Antichrist. That's the one that will rise to power halfway through. If you look just a page or so over in your Bible to to the book of 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you see there in verse 3, he he references this person he calls the man of lawlessness. It's the same person. That's who he's talking about, this single dominant world leader that will rise to power halfway through the tribulation. How do we know that? We don't have all the details about these end times events, the chronology. How do we know this guy will rise to power halfway through? In the book of the Revelation, let me just say this, a small side note. Tiny little pastoral pet peeve. It is the book of the Revelation, singular, 
not the book of Revelations, plural. That's how we often refer to, you hear people refer to the book of the Revelations. The very first sentence of, of the book of the Revelation, verse 1, chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And now if you read through the book of the Revelation, you say there's some pretty wild stuff happening in that book. Some pretty diverse scenes. There's a lot of things we're told of in the book of the Revelation. How can that be one? But this is one solid vision that God has given to the Apostle John there in the book of the Revelation. Think of it this way. It's like a movie. You go and you watch a movie and there's a lot of scenes that happen in that movie. Some of them are, are diverse and they seem initially to be disconnected. There's a lot of drama that maybe happens in that movie. A lot of different characters are introduced to throughout the course of that movie. But at the end of the day, it's one movie, right? It's one story. You can look at the book of the Revelation that way. It's one vision from start to finish where God is revealing some of these end times things that will happen. The book of the Revelation, chapter 13, tells us this about the rise of this man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. John says there in, in chapter 13 that this one will reign for 42 months, three and a half years. So we know if the whole period seven years, he will reign three and a half, he comes to power halfway through. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 that when this one rises up, this will now be a period of great tribulation. We, we commonly call the last half of that the great tribulation. That's what Jesus called it. There will be a great tribulation. Not only will the, the wrath of God continue to be poured out on the world, but this man, the Antichrist, this dominant world leader, will step up his harsh persecution of the church during that last three and a half years, those believers that are still there during that time. There is the rapture, the tribulation, the third puzzle piece of the end times is what we call the second coming of Christ. Now, whether this happens at a separate time as the rapture, or this happens at the same time as the rapture, we'll talk about that here in just a minute. But the fact of the second coming, the fact that Jesus will come again, that's one of the most widely taught topics in all of Scripture. Twelve of the 27 books of the New Testament reference the second coming of Christ. Over and over again in the Old Testament, particularly in the prophets, we see them looking forward to this time they call the, the day of the Lord. They're referring to the second coming. It's one of the most widely taught topics in all of Scripture. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 that when this second coming happens, and by the way, if you want to get a good sense of some things that are going to happen there in the end times, Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 24. He's, he's the main event. He's the star of the show. We want to get a pretty good idea of some things that are going to happen. Read his words. He's the one that's coming at this point in time. And he says of the second coming there in Matthew chapter 24, that that time he will put an end to that seven years of tribulation. His coming will put an end to that. In Revelation 16, in, verse 9, in chapter 19, Tell us that at the end of that time of tribulation, at the second coming of Christ, that will initiate this, this final battle between God and the forces of evil, the forces of Satan. You, you have heard of that. Revelation 16 calls that the battle of Armageddon, Har Megiddo, in the hills outside of the Israeli town of Megiddo. That will end this time of the tribulation. The second coming will kick off the battle of Armageddon. And then the last piece, the last puzzle piece for us to flip over on the table and take a look at is what the Bible calls the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ. Revelation chapter 20 tells us that during that time, Satan and his minions will be chained up in the corner of hell. They'll no longer have free reign. They'll be chained up for that period of time. Jesus and his church will rule the earth for a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, Satan and his minions will be let loose once again, once again to deceive the heart of man, pointing once and all. Man is not inherently good. We are, in, we are born sinful, inherently sinful. Even after a thousand years of reign with Christ, we still will be deceived. They'll be set loose, and then after that, there will come a time of judgment. Satan and his minions, all unbelievers of, of all times, will stand judgment at the great white throne judgment. And then Christ will set up his new heaven and his new earth. Now, I know that was a lot of details. That's a lot of puzzle pieces on the table. That's a lot of things to look at. And those are really just kind of the big block ideas. I didn't go into a lot of detail about 
some of those things. If you want some greater detail, the book of the Revelation talks a great deal about some of these things, how they're going to look. What are some of the things that are going to happen during this time of period we refer to at the end time? Starting in chapter 6 of the Revelation all the way through to chapter 21, if you want to spend some time kind of looking through some of the details, go there and check that out. These are the big muscle movements. But once you have the puzzle pieces laid out on the table, then what's your next step? You've got to start putting them together, right? How do these things fit together? What are, how are these pieces all come together in some sort of semblance of order? How will it happen? We've looked at what's going to happen. What are those big muscle movements? How are these things going to happen? That's the core of the question that drove this message this morning. And of course, we're talking about timing. Now, I, I said earlier, and I'll say it again. I'll even mention it, I think, one more time. The Bible doesn't give us enough information for us to form any kind of dug in or dogmatic position to say this is the way things must happen in the end times that doesn't stop us from doing that but the bible doesn't give us information for us to make those kinds of dogmatic dug in positions and the timing of this event that paul talks about here in first thessalonians 4 i think perhaps that's the most debated of them when will this thing the rapturo when christ catches up his church up to himself. When will this thing happen in that timeline of end times events? There are two main ideas that have emerged over time. One idea is that this event in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 will happen before those seven years of tribulation. You may have heard this viewpoint labeled called pre-trib. That time, the rapture, comes before the time of the tribulation. That's one viewpoint. The other viewpoint, of course, is that this time that Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 happens after the tribulation, post-trib, you may have heard that called. Let me in these next few moments give you kind of the 30,000-foot view of both of those, and then I'm going to ratchet up my dangerous uh, adventure a little bit this morning, and I'm going to tell you how I think these things fit together, where I fall on this matter. First of all, let's look at the 30,000-foot look, these two viewpoints. Does this event in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 happen before or after the tribulation? What are the two camps? What are the two ideas here? The pre-trib position is basically this, that what Paul is talking about here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and the second coming of Christ are two distinctly different issues that happen at different periods of time. The rapture happens pre-trib, before the seven years of tribulation. These two events bookend the tribulation. The rapture happens first. In fact, it is the thing that kicks off the period of the tribulation. The rapture happens. God pulls his church out. Then the tribulation happens. The second coming is, is on the other end, the other bookend, the thing that ends the time of the tribulation. And the main point is this that the reason for pulling the church out comes back to the reason for the tribulation in the first place. The purpose, remember I mentioned earlier that, that Daniel lays out the purpose statement for the tribulation, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness. And so the pre-trib position is basically this, that those purposes have already been fulfilled in the lives of believers through Christ. And so it serves no purpose for the church to be here during the time of the tribulation. Hence, God would have raptured his church prior to it happening. They look at verses like 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Just flip back over there one page. Paul said there in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, he said, Jesus rescues us from the wrath to come. In other words, he's going to, he's going to pull us out before that wrath is to come. That's the idea in the pre-trib pre argument. And also over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, God has not destined us for wrath, us being the church. That's the crux of the pre-trib argument. The church will not be here because it doesn't fulfill the purpose. The post-trib argument, on the other hand, is basically that the rapture and the second coming happen at the same time. They are two phases, if you will, of the exact same event. They all happen at the end of the tribulation. It still puts an end to it, but they happen at the same time. They point back to Matthew chapter 24. Again, here's Jesus talking about these end times events. And they see in that text where Jesus seems to indicate there will be believers that will undergo the tribulation. In fact, they say, you know, the broader 
teaching of Scripture talks a lot about trials, a lot about tribulation in the lives of believers. And the promise continually throughout Scripture is not that we will be pulled out of those trials, but that God will sustain us through them. Now think about Jesus' high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, where he says to the Father, he says, I don't pray that you would take them out of the world, but protect them from the evil one. That's sort of the crux of the post-trib argument. We're going to go through this. There's not a promise that we'll be taken out of trials or temptations. Now, where do I fall on the question? How do I think these puzzle pieces fit together? Well, now, before I give you my answer, let me give you this disclaimer. You don't have to agree with my opinion on this to be a part of our fellowship at this church. You don't have to be, you don't have to be in agreement with my opinion uh, for us to, to share in Christian fellowship. For you to even be a member of this church, you don't necessarily have to agree with my opinion on this one issue. I make no judgment about your commitment to Christ, nor your commitment to the truthfulness of Scripture based on how you fall down on this question. Now, I say that for a reason, because I have talked with people that make those sorts of judgments based on this one issue. I was talking to a guy one time. We were talking about these end times events, how they all fit together. He had a very strong opinion, as many of us do about these end times events, had a very strong opinion about how they fit together. And he said this. He said, if you don't believe this position, then I question your commitment to the inerrancy of Scripture. I don't come down there. I don't think that I know we don't have enough details in Scripture for us to be that dogmatic. Now, all of my disclaimers out there, all of my disclaimers laid out, where do I fall on this matter? How do I think these things fit together the best? I fall in the pre-trib camp. And here's why, the reasons I fall into the pre-trib camps. I figure that if it's good enough for Nicolas Cage and it's good enough for Kirk Cameron, then it's good enough for me. No, that's not really the reason. You can see there are compelling biblical arguments on both sides. I just gave you the big sort of the big main point. But there are compelling biblical arguments on both sides. Of the, but I think the pre-trib idea better fits with what we know about what we know from Scripture. First of all, there is that matter of purpose. The reasons and the purpose for the tribulation don't seem to apply in the lives of believers. We know that God is a God of purpose. We talked just last week, we were focused, remember, on the creation. We were talking about whether evolution fits in, in our beliefs in the Bible, but when we look back to the creation account, we see a very purposeful, methodical God, right? The way he laid out the days of creation. Even those gigantic things, God is a God of purpose. Several weeks ago, we went through the book of Esther. And we were looking there about how God has purpose even in some of the seemingly insignificant details of our lives. He's still a God of purpose. Everything he does has purpose. Everything has meaning. It doesn't seem to fit the purpose of the tribulation for the church to go through those times. It doesn't seem to fulfill its purpose. It doesn't seem to fulfill the purpose of God's justice and God's righteousness on display. Back in Genesis chapter 18, Abraham is having a conversation with God concerning the coming destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember that? And, and Abraham is appealing to God's sense of justice. Now, it's not that God has forgotten. It's not that he needed to be reminded. But Abraham is appealing to God's sense of justice there in Genesis chapter 18, verse 25. And he says this. He said, Far be it from you, Lord, to do such a thing to treat the righteous and the wicked alike and bring that same judgment on the righteous and on the wicked. And it doesn't seem to serve the purpose to have the church there during the tribulation. I think it comes back to a purpose statement. The other thing is this, that the description of the rapture and the description of the second coming seem to be two separate events in Scripture. It seems like the Bible's talking about two distinctly different events things. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says the church meets Jesus in the air, and there's no indication he goes any further. He seems to stop in midair at that point. The church comes to him at the second coming. The prophet Zechariah in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 14, 
tells us that at the second coming, Jesus comes all the way. He stands on the Mount of Olives. He splits it in two. We talked just a moment ago about the Battle of Armageddon, Har Megiddo, in a very real town of Megiddo out there in Israel. There will be a battle that will take place right here on this earth. In the second coming, Jesus comes all the way to the earth. These seem to be two different events. And the second coming is to judge the ungodly, to establish Christ's kingdom. We look here in 1 Thessalonians 4, there's no judgment that is referenced, no judgment that seems to be talked about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul talks about these things that in a moment, an instant, we all, we all will not sleep, but we will all be changed. In an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, he uses some of the same language he uses here. But even there, 1 Corinthians 15, there's no judgment talked about. In John chapter 14, Jesus' promise, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. You remember that, John 14, 3. There's no judgment there in John chapter 14. These seem to be two very different things, the rapture and the second coming. And the rapture seems to happen in almost a secretive way. I don't like that term, but it was the best one I could come up with. It almost seems to happen in a way where those who are left behind don't see it coming. Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 24, verses 40 and 41. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. There's this, this scene, you can almost picture it in your mind, right? Where these, these guys are out in the field and they're picking and they're pulling out the, the plants and suddenly the guy turns and his co-worker is gone. He seems to be unaware. Listen to the things that Paul says will, will happen when this thing happens in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord himself will descend with a shout. There will be the voice of the archangel. Now, I don't know what that sounds like, but I imagine this giant James Earl Jones, Darth Vader sounding voice that's going to thunder across the earth. The trumpet of God will blast. Those that Jesus talked about picking in the field and suddenly my coworker is gone, they seem to be unaware of any of those things. Don't you think the shout of Christ and the voice of the archangel, the trumpet blast of God might have gotten their attention? Something big is getting ready to happen. They seem to be completely unaware of that. Now we contrast that with what Revelation chapter 1 says of the second coming. Every eye will see him on that day. And when Jesus describes it there in Matthew chapter 24, he says it will happen with great power, great glory. In fact, the unbelievers, the ones that are still on this earth that have not trusted in Christ, he says in Matthew 24, will mourn his coming that day. There will be no mistake. No one's going to miss the second coming. There seems to be an aspect of the, the rapture that is missed by some. They don't really see it coming. At the second coming, no one will miss that event. Everyone will notice it. They seem to be two very different events. Now, this is how I believe these pieces all fit together. We're going to assemble the puzzle pieces real quick. Christ will come in the air. He'll rapture his church, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That will kick off the seven years of the tribulation. Halfway through, the Antichrist will rise. The Great Tribulation is the second half. Jesus' second coming will end the tribulation, initiate the Battle of Armageddon. The defeated forces of hell will be chained in the abyss for a thousand years. Afterwards, we'll face judgment along with all unbelievers of all time at the great white throne of judgment. That's how I think these puzzle pieces fit together. Now, we got to that point, right? We dumped all the pieces on the table. We took a look at what parts and pieces we had of the puzzle. We tried to assemble them together in some semblance of order. But there comes a point in time when you're building a puzzle, right, that you kind of get stuck down in the details. You're sort of looking at all these pieces, and after a while you forget what it is that you're looking at, right? You forget the big picture. What do you do at that point? You pull out the box top, right? What does the big picture really look like? And that's what I want to say. The last question I want us to answer is this. Why does it matter? What's the, the big picture to all of this? God didn't give us all of the details to fill in all of the blanks about some of these things. Why did he tell us about them at all then? Why does it matter about these events? Now, when we think of the significance of these events, what's the first thing the human mind almost always tracks to? When, right? 
That's the question that seems to obsess our minds. When is this going to take place? I think that has been the case. I think every generation from the first century, from the time that Christ said these words in Matthew 24 on forward, I think every generation has thought their generation is the one that these things are going to happen in. I think that's the question the Thessalonians were asking Paul. Jump down for a minute to 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5, verses 1 and 2. He says, Now as to the times and the epochs, you have no need of anything to be written to you. I think they asked the question, When's this going to happen, Paul? Is this going to happen now? He said, You have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well the day of the Lord will come, just like a thief in the night. I think that was their question. That most definitely was the question the disciples asked Jesus. You read very early in Matthew 24. That's the question. Lord, when will these things happen? The human brain seems to track towards that. What's interesting to me is when, G when they ask Jesus that question, he, he almost dismisses it. He never answers the question. In fact, he, he kind of goes through the same sort of exercise we just went through. What are the muscle, big muscle events that are going to happen, the big muscle movements? How do these things fit together a little bit? And then he makes this statement in Matthew chapter 24. He said, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. And he almost dismisses their question. He says, listen, if, if the Father hasn't given me the exact date, don't think it matters to you all that much. The very thing that we think is the most significant matter, biblically seems to be the most insignificant thing. But it's the thing that, that sticks in our heads. As a matter of fact, I... I looked at this article, a friend of mine shared it on Facebook the other day. This was the title of the article. The Bible says the world is going to end on June 24th, 2018. Now that's pretty significant, right? That's three weeks from today. So if that is true, we kind of need to know that. Does the Bible in fact say the world is going to end on the 24th of June of 2018? We've got to have to know that. That's important. Now, here's how it said, the article said this guy came up with this date. Now, first of all, it said he's a conspiracy theorist. Now, maybe that should have been the first red flag in anyone reading the article to say he's not a biblical scholar, he's not a theologian, he is a self-professed conspiracy theorist. Now, this is what he said. He said, if you add the number of crop harvests along with the prices of those harvests, not really sure how the number of ears of corn that grow, nor the price of them, has anything to do with the second coming of Christ. But nonetheless, this is the formula he used. Add the number of crop harvests along with the price. You add in the number 666, which is the number of the beast. Identify the number of the Antichrist, identified there in the book of the Revelation. Factor in the 42 months of the Antichrist's reign. And when all these are added together, it comes up to the 24th of June, 2018. We chase after this. We're obsessed with the date. But here's the thing, that is maybe the most insignificant of the issues of why God revealed these facts to us. In fact, I think the significant thing is that we're not told the date. I think that's the most significant thing of it. Why does this matter? We're not told the date. The significance is the imminence of this event. It could happen at any time. None of us have any idea the rapture could happen right now or in a minute, or in 10 minutes. We don't know when it's coming. I think that's the significance. Listen, let's be honest. If we, if we knew it was the 24th of June of 2018, when would we get serious about the Great Commission? Well, maybe today, if you're uber spiritual, you're super committed, three weeks out, you might get serious. But let's be honest, when would most of us get serious? The 23rd, right? That's when we get serious about sharing the Great Commission. That's when we get serious about responding to the Great Commission. I think the significance is the imminence of this. There is an urgency to the Great Commission, both for us to share it, and if you haven't trusted in Christ, for you to respond to the gospel message. We don't know how many more heartbeats we have in this world. We don't know we're not promised one more, not one more day, not one more decade. And we're certainly not promised that the tribulation is going to hold off any amount of time. We don't know when the rapture is going to kick off, when that thing is going to happen. I think that's the significance, is the imminence. We don't know when. It will come like a thief in the night, completely unexpected. And so we have to always be ready, both us as believers to share and to respond to the gospel. 
Second thing, though, is that it gives us certainty that Jesus lives. We know that the core belief of, of Christianity, right, very different from other religions. All the other world religions, they point to a dead guy in a tomb somewhere. Islam talks, points to Muhammad. You can find Muhammad. He's in his tomb. Buddhism talks about Buddha. You can find him. He's in Buddha's tomb. You roll away the stone to Jesus' tomb. What do you find? Nothing. It's a core aspect of Christianity. But at that second coming, when every eye will see him on that day in power and in glory, there will be no question our Redeemer lives. Third thing, though, is I think it's that we realize from these end time events that the promise of life after death, that's more than just some philosophical musings. More than just something we tell someone who's lost a loved one to make them feel better. There is, in fact, life after beyond the grave. How do we know that? We see that here. When Christ comes, the dead in Christ will rise. There will be this grand reunion of all believers of all times right there in the air. The promise of life after death is not just some philosophical musing. And Jesus said this, I mentioned this earlier, John chapter 14, verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Where was he talking about? He was talking about heaven. That's what he was talking about. That's the place he will go and prepare that mansion in his father's house. We will be with him. The promise of life after death is more than just a philosophical idea. I think the last thing that we'll talk about this morning is the promise that God will defeat evil and set things right. We can count on that as we, as we look to these end times events. We sang in that song just a few minutes ago, you've never failed and you won't start now. And we look to the end times events and we see when God returns and he sets things right, the overwhelming defeat of evil in this world, and he sets things right. Next week, we're going to talk about this question that often people have in their mind. They have a, a hard time with a loving and powerful God because of what they see going on around them. But the end times remind us of this. God's had a plan all along. It's tracking exactly as he planned it out to track. None, nothing that happens, nothing that's happening today takes God by surprise. He's not taken off guard by any of these things. And at the end times, we look forward to those events. We're reminded that God will finish what he started. He who began this good work will be faithful. He will defeat evil. He will set things right. Now, very quickly, let me give you a couple of resources to jot down. If you want to dig a little bit further into this, you want to study this a little bit more, we still have the Lord's Supper to, to jump into. So let me just give you these real quick. You write them down quick, I'll talk quick. First is an article called, What is the Rapture? In fact, if you put that in your Google search field, just what is the rapture, you'll see two uh, very good articles will pop up. One is from Billy Graham Ministries, billygram.org. The other is this article that I'm going to recommend to you on a website called gotquestions.org. This will give you an overview of the rapture. At the bottom of that article, there's links if you want to dig further. How does this relate to the second coming? How does this relate to the tribulation? You can dig a little further. An article called, What is the Rapture? on the website gotquestions.org. The second one is a, is a book by Pastor John MacArthur called The Second Coming. You want to dig a little bit further, John MacArthur is, is very academic about how he approaches these things, very biblical and very academic. You can dig into that and read through that book, The Second Coming by Pastor John MacArthur. If you want to dig a little bit more into the post-tribulation argument, I just want to just give you the pre-trib position, the post-trib argument. There is a, an article, this is a longer title, so I'm going to write it down and give you a sec second to record it, or mention it, you can take a second to write it down. Nine Reasons We Can Be Confident Christians Won't Be Raptured Before the Tribulation by Pastor John Piper. Nine Reasons We Can Be Confident Christians Won't Be Raptured by, Before the Tribulation. In fact, I think that comes up if, in the same Google search, what is the rapture? You can find that article on a website called gospelcoalition.org. Some other resources if you want to dig further into these questions. So the initial question we started with was when will the rapture of the church happen? We don't have any great deal of certainty about when that would happen, but here's what is certain. God has fulfilled every other promise he's ever made up to this point. We have a high degree of confidence he'll fulfill these as well. And we can have certainty that the end times will accomplish the purpose that God has for them. 
the urgency of his gospel, both to preach it and to respond to it. The affirmation that Jesus is in fact alive, he is who he said he was, the promise of life in heaven after death, a confirmation of God as the righteous judge. Those are the purposes of the end time. When we see these events, we have a great deal of confidence. And for the believer, the end times are not a scary thing. Let me just end with this, what Paul said once again in verse 18 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He said, comfort one another with these words. Would you pray with me this morning?